זה באמת כבוד גדול ניתן לי היום לייצג את אלפי חבריי בהסתדרות הרבנים בלבי לבבות חברי בתי כנסת באמריקה הצפונית, אירופה וישראל. באנו לכבוד שנת יובל החמישים של הקמת מדינת ישראל ורצוני למסור שאין עוד ארגון של רבנים ואף לא תנועה ציונית גדולה ביותר בגולה אשר כך קשור בלב ובנפש, בגוף ובנשמה עם מדינת ישראל. Mr. President, we compose a distinguished collection of sages and scholars, rabbis and teachers who lead congregations devoted to the state of Israel. As such, we are in a unique position to guide and advocate ideals that enhance the Jewish soul and country and to respond with one voice when crisis prevails. Dynamic forces have forged our history, molded our theology, and formed our ideology. We subscribe to a common covenant of life, and we advance a common vocabulary of values. Our religious and spiritual ties to Israel, our historic and national connection to the country, is a divine reality and unequivocal. It is guided by a deep devotion to our Torah and tradition. In honor of the 50th anniversary of the State of Israel, we pledge our international support to commemorate the miraculous moment consecrated with vision and blood, prayer and sacrifice. Joining me are the thousands of rabbis throughout the world, their congregants, We have here the Chief Rabbi of Poland, Rav Pinchas Yaskowitz, the former Chief Rabbi of France, Rabbi René Sarat, the Chief Rabbi of Romania, Rabbi Yecheskel Mark, the Chief Rabbi of Salonika, Rabbi Yitzchak Dayan, the Chief Rabbi of Paris, Rav David Nassas, the Chief Rabbi of Madrid, Rav Ben Azulin, Rav Shlomo Sharfman, the President of RCA in Israel, Throughout the world, our rabbis and teachers will speak to the heart and conscience of people to secure the proper respect and express our solidarity for this outstanding milestone of the Jubilee year. We give thanks and praise to God of Israel, who in mercy granted us the privilege of witnessing the redemption of our people in our time, and we honor those who were heavenly tools in the creation of the state. Mr. President, you have been a venerable pioneer, soldier, and leader, and we honor you today. I am calling upon Mr. Arbusfeld, the Chairman of the Committee for the Preservation of the Jewish Character of Israel, to make a presentation to the President, and Rabbi Trau, Yoshev Rosh of our Kenes in Yerushalayim, to pronounce the blessing. Gentlemen. Mr. President, yesterday was the first day of our conference, which was held in the Renaissance Hotel. The, see, the theme of this session was man's search for eternal truths in a changing world. That theme meshes very nicely with the committee of which I am the president, the Committee for the Preservation of the Jewish character of the State of Israel. Jewish character and eternal truths are one and the same and have the same source. Our Tanakh, our Mishnah, our Gemara, and the Yam HaTorah. It is not the purpose of our committee to put a strangle on every man in Israel or a shetel on every woman. Because if you know the price of a strangle and a shetel, you'll know we can't afford it. It would take another $10 billion loan guarantee from America. 
our goals are far more modest. In many synagogues, after Mincha and Shabbat, we read from Pirkei Avot. Let me cite one Mishnah, and for the sake of brevity, I'll even skip some words. Ezeu Chacham, Halomed Mikol Adam. Ezehu Gibor, Hakovesha Sitro. Ezehu Oshir, Hasomeach Bechelko. Ezehu Muchubad, Hamachabeda Tabriyo. Torah values are so different from secular values. Most people think that the wise person is one who can teach. The strong person is one who dominates others. The wealthy person is the one who has many possessions. And that the honorable person is the one who receives acclaim. The Torah tells us just the reverse. True wisdom is the capacity to learn. True strength is the mastery over oneself. True wealth is enjoying what one has, and true honor is recognizing others. These are eternal truths. These are Torah values. This is what Jewish character is about. This and much more is what we want to impart in the people of Israel. Those who say that they want Israel to be like every, every other country is doing us a terrible disservice. You cannot be a beacon, a light unto the nations and be like every other country. It is the Jewish character that will distinguish us and will make us the envy of the world. Mr. President, we are gathered here this year in celebration of the Chag HaYovel Shel HaKamat Medinat Yisrael. I and many others of a certain age, we're getting older. Yes. <laughs> we of a certain age, the thought of a Jewish state was a dream and its reality a miracle. Yet here we are in this magnificent Bet Hanasi. This is a very moving and emotional moment for many of us. Being here in the presence of a president who may help make it all possible, a universally acclaimed hero of the Mohammed HaShikhur. There is so much that divides our people and citing all these divisions would take me all morning. Yet Baruch Hashem, there are areas where the Jewish people are united. Every Jew considers Israel his spiritual home. To support, to defend, to live here. We are also united in looking towards the president of Israel as our Manhig Yisrael, particularly someone with the charisma, the charm, the outspokenness of an Asa Weitzman. Mr. President, <laughs> Mr. President, you do us proud. Before I present you to this distinguished audience, I want to present something from us to you. Recently at a ceremony held in this room, you mentioned how during the war years, <laughs> the Mohammed Ashikru, <laughs> which was a time of great personal sakana for yourself and for Am Yisrael, you always had a Tanakh, which you cherished and from which you learned and which you do so, continue doing so to this very day. It is our pleasure to present you, Mr. President, with this beautiful Tanakh. 
And with it, our prayers and our blessings that you have our richash yomim and briyut, good health and long life, so that the beacon of your leadership will guide us for many, many years to come. And I want to read from the inscription in this Tanakh. Please, Mr. President. L'chvod nasi midinat Yisrael, ma'eza Weizmann, l'regel shnat hayovel she midinat Yisrael, v'hokara al kol pu'olecho l'ma midinat Yisrael, ulaman kalal Yisrael, from the Histadrut HaRabbin de America, v'hava l'shimu ha'ofi ha'yehudi she midinat Yisrael. Mr. President. Please rise. Mr. President, I'm deeply humbled. It's a deep and extreme privilege for me to be able to recite the bracha, the shame of Malchus, in honor of, the, of our president, as a white spam. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Chalak Mechodo, Yehea. I'll be quite honest. Hello, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. But I'll be quite honest, I didn't know what to expect this morning. Rabbis from all over the world, United States, and this hall and this house has had an experience of many, many groups, many guests, and many introductions. I, uh, I was moved to listen to where is he, Rafaim, where is he? So humble, all the way back. <laughs> and uh, sometimes when people introduce me, you know, I, I, I have to look at myself if this is me. I'm 73 years old, last month in June. So now about. I was born in Tel Aviv in 1924 to a dear mother who was born in Rishon Lezion 102 years ago and to a terrific father who came here before the First World War in 1914. He came here for the purpose of helping tilling the land of Eretz Yisrael. For that, coming from a little village in Russia called Motelik. Bottle. Family moved to Pinsk, where they all grew up, and he had, he was the youngest of twelve. My grandfather and grandmother were very productive. Fifteen were born, twelve grew to be adults. Nine of them academicians, ten of them buried in Israel with their mother. When I was on my first visit to Russia, I wanted to go to Pinsk and see my grandfather's tombstone and see the name Asia Weizmann on a tombstone. But the Germans destroyed the cemetery. And all these brothers and sisters were learned. They all studied from the girls. There were seven girls. I knew them all. One of them I vaguely remember because I was skinny when she died. There were two doctors, one dentist, one pianist, uh, one chemist, professor of chemistry. From the five gentlemen, there were two chemists. Everybody thinks that Professor Weizmann is the only chemist or practically in the world, but he had a brother, Moshe, who was a professor in the Hebrew University. And um, one engineer and my late father, an agronomer. And I started with my late father because he didn't know a word of German. He knew Russian very well. And they all spoke Yiddish. That's where I know my little bit of Yiddish because we lived in the same house with my grandmother who couldn't speak a word of anything but Yiddish. And she was a great lady. So a little bit of mumbling in, in Yiddish I know from conversing with her 
to the age of 15 when she, when she passed away. And he went to Berlin to study agriculture in the Berlin University. Some went to Odessa, some went to Zurich, some went to, 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 to London. And with the purpose of coming here, and in, in, in his first visit was 1912, permanently 1914, straight to a farm with the ideology that we're going to build a country based on the land, based on agriculture, based on bringing back as many Jews as possible and putting them on the land and killing the land of the Holy Land. Later on, he developed like many Jews and he became a businessman. But uh, this was the mood of Zionism a hundred years ago. My late mother's family came here even before that. I have a, a grandfather and a great-grandfather whom I never met, who came from the Ukraine, Poltava. At the end of the, of the 19th century, they're buried in the house 18. So I feel very Mayflowerish. If I may use this American <laughs> expression. And many came after, some more dedicated, some less dedicated. The first kibbutz started in Ghana, more settlements. The Baron Rothschild helped Rishon Lezion, Petach Tikva, and Siona, Gedera, Roshpina. I don't know if you know these places. Most of them named, the biblical names, Petach Tikva and Rishon Lezion, and Lezion, the old biblical. And in those villages, every little settlement had a synagogue. And the one in Rishon Lezion, where my late lady was, was born, is still existing the way it was 110, 115 years ago. And then things started to change. More people came. Not enough. I don't want to start Aliyah this morning. You do what you want, bless your soul, you're happy where you are. I don't want to start preaching today. I hope it won't get into the mood as I go on. But from the beginning, the Arabs didn't like the idea. And we started trouble. We had the first bad trouble in 1921. This is when the defense forces were formed. Jabotinsky was one of the first ones, then he split, but he was one of the founders of the defense forces. And then 1929, which I can vaguely remember, I was five, five years old. But I'll tell you one story here concerning 1929. I got a letter about two years ago, I've been here over four years ago, from a man in Zichon, who must be an old man, I don't know whether he's still, still, he's still alive, telling me that my late uncle, who was the third in the hierarchy of the family, um, visited their home in Salzburg in 1929. And the message came in as, of the massacre in Hebron in 1929. And I asked him, why did the British behave the way they did? Or why didn't they behave differently the way they behaved? And didn't stop when they were the rulers of the land. And he looked at me and said, young boy, if between 1919 and 1929, a million Jews would have arrived and settled in Israel, you wouldn't have asked me this question. Without referring to present situation. Then, a few interesting things about the pre-statehood. One of the main things that we brought to life was the Hebrew language. I was brought up in Hebrew. And before the state, there were Hebrew schools, there was a Hebrew educational system run by education department of the, of the then Zionist or national organization, whatever you want to call it. The um, unifying force of Israel today is the language. There are two unifying forces today. You can say that the tradition, etc., but it doesn't unify everybody. But the unifying forces today is the army and the language. And the army unifies 90%. Unfortunately, not everybody. And it's very interesting to know or to realize or to distinguish that pre-state 
we had three universities. We had the Technion, Technion School and High Technical Institute in Haifa, which was, I think, founded in 1910. The Hebrew University in 1925. And it's interesting that it's known as the Hebrew University, not the Jerusalem area. We have the Haifa University, the Tel Aviv University, the Ben Gurion University, and the Hebrew University. But it was significant to that. Because it's the first time that an academy, not the first, but it was, it was a, a Hebrew university, taught in Hebrew. That's one thing that we have to remember. And it's, this, it's still known as our Universa Ha'ivrit Yerushalayim, not the Jerusalem. The other wish and force that led the people of Israel, who by then in the 30s were only about 300,000 to 400,000, was to try and be creative not only in agriculture. There was a little bit of industry starting there. Not very much. Not very much. The creation of the defense force, and parallel to all these things of settling the Jews on the land, Tel Aviv, first Jewish city, there too many Romanian going there now. And was the attempt to find a way to converse with the Arabs. Because, ladies and gentlemen, if we don't come to an understanding with the Arabs in the long run, and we'll be a, a, a fortress Israel in the Middle East, and Halanetzach to Hal I don't think this is a Jewish message. And a Jewish, a Jewish mes message is the Haftal Reachakamocha. And a Jewish message also, which take it lovingly, is Tov Shachem Tov Achacho. I also would like to have an Achacho. But it's Mishlei. I didn't invent it. Mishlei says Tov Shachem Tov Achacho. Rather a close neighbor than a distant brother. I don't know whether it's the uh, correct translation. And all our leaders, including my late uncle, attempt all the time to deal with the leaders there. He went to see King Faisal in Iraq, and they were all trying and not very successful. And we were started battling the Arabs very severely in the 30s, right to 36. And in 1936 38 was the first attempt to find a solution. I have, I'm leading somewhere. There was a P Lord Peel Commission in 1936 that recommended to the British government that were then in charge of, of, of Israel to partition Palestine between a Jewish state and, Palestine, and, and, a, and an Arab. The Arabs didn't, didn't want to, didn't want to. Some of our leaders accepted. Then the war broke out, the big one. And Holocaust, a terrible thing for six years of, of hard battles. We were then a community of about, just about 550, close to 600,000, out, out of which 30,000 volunteered and joined the British force, army and air force, very few in the air force, mostly in the army. And when the war was over in 45, in May in Europe and August in Japan, I did my last year in the Far East and I was in the Royal Air Force. And my last year was flying an American fighter plane, which to you won't mean anything. It's a very good one. Um, never heard of a, of a P-47, no. Yes? Who had of this? You? Wait, 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 wait. You had one? It's a good plane. <laughs> No, they, they weren't parallel. Then it's P-51. But I'm willing to, to exchange the... Uh, yeah. Now, we didn't like the fact that the British were here. And the action against the British stopped. The British were here for 30 years. 1917 to 1947-48. And then a decision of the United Nations Again, a decision of solving the, the, the Jewish Arab problem is to partition the country. We accepted, the Arabs did not. 
the map of Israel recommended to that commission was a, a horrific thing, but we accepted. They did not. And this I keep telling them. I told that to Arafat only a few days ago. You made a mistake. You made a few mistakes. You didn't accept this. You didn't join Ken David. And the war started. Our war of independence. Which was one of the, which was the most difficult one. We lost 1% of the population. We lost 6,000 out of 600,000. Now the United States today is what, 250,000, 260 uh, million? It's as if two and a half, two point six million, God forbid, would die in 18 months in the wars between America and God knows who. America didn't lose that in two world wars. Because we fought with the skin of our teeth. There was a hand-to-hand -hand battle, hand grenade battle. In the Air Force, we began with small aircraft. Later on, we got a few better aeroplanes. I had the great pleasure, an unusual experience, of flying a German message that we got from Czechoslovakia. We got 25, 24, one crashed on the way. And uh, we fought for the Jewish state against British Spitfires flown by the Egyptians with message 109s flown by our, by our pilots which was a, a cynical experience of history. And then we stopped where we stopped. And gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, we wanted to get to the Jordan in 1948 and 49. We wanted to take more than we did. We did have, didn't have enough strength to take the whole of Israel. And we were stuck at what is known as the Green Line now. We were in the East Jerusalem, in East Jerusalem, we we're in Geneva, we we're in Latrun, we we're in Gush Etzion, and unfortunately we lost it to the Jordan. There was one reason. We didn't have enough strength, we didn't have enough Jews. If we had more Jews, if we had 10,000 who fought in the American British Army, and they would have come here to fight with us, the whole map of Israel would have been different. But you don't cry over spilled blood. And now we pay dearly for what we didn't achieve in 48 and we achieved in 67. It's not the same thing. Because we, when you do something, it, it, there's a timing for everything. And when we're everybody, well, the whole world was relatively with us. And in 67, it's known as occupied territory. And for 30 years, 48, 47 to 70, to 1977, there were bitter battles. There was a war of independence, there was the Sinai campaign with the French and the British, in between all sorts of skirmishes, then the Six Day War and the October War, and unfortunately the Lebanese War too. We buried, and I hope we'll stop burying, close to 19,000 of our sons and daughters in battle. For 20 years now, we're trying to, to find peace. And again, history must have the right timing and the right figures when it comes to achieve certain things. Because history is a, is, a, is, a, is a stream that flows. You need someone to take it and change it a bit or stop it or push it harder. We're three gentlemen. It happened to be at the same time the top of country. One was Mr. Blake, Mr. Begin. One was the late President Sadat. May he live for many years, Jimmy Carter. And when Sadat felt after the October War that he gave us a bloody nose, which he did, that he crossed the canal, and the canal is open now, that he has troops over the eastern side of Sinai, he can with a certain pride, come and talk to us. The only country celebrating the October War is Egypt, neither Syria nor us. And we both know why. He had a certain achievement. I was very close to him, and he used to tell me, after the October War, I could speak to you with a clean conscience. The clean conscience was to Egyptians, not to me. And in 1977, a thing that we've wanted all our lives, from the, from the founders, back in the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, an Arab leader came to Jerusalem 
I want to talk with you. And he was a quite a leader. And facing him was Menachem Begin, who was also a hell of a character. I once told Sadat when I was sitting with him and my dear wife in Ismailia, um, chatting away with his wife, Jan. And I told him, you know, Mr. President, when Mr. Begin and you joined politics, the theater lost two great actors. And you have to be a certain actor if you want to lead people. Because leadership has a certain element of acting. And after 16 months of hard work, with Jimmy Carter having an interest, a, a genuine interest, human, human interest, and, a, and, and an interest in the United States and the world, invited us to come camping with him in Camp David. And in 1979, 26th of March, we signed the first peace treaty with an Arab country. All I can say is we better think hard and be wise not to lose it. And now the peace is lukewarm, sometimes cool, sometimes a bit warmer, but we still have an open canal. We don't have any troops in the Sinai. We used to keep almost two divisions there. We have just a few patrols along the Egyptian border, which is quite a long border. El Al flies there. We go there. In the last few months, the situation is tense because I would have, I wouldn't have liked to see a cartoon of a of a, of a pig on the Torah. What would we have said if something like this would have been pushed to us? And this caused a lot of trouble in the Arab world, in the Muslim world. And let's not forget that Turkey is also a Muslim country and very friendly with us. Our air force flies there and back. We land there. We come. There's quite uh, quite a happening going on between Turkey and us. So the horror of Syria, Iraq, and Egypt doesn't like it. Hard luck. And then we have peace with with Jordan now. For, I think it's the fourth year or third. Year. And Gil Hussein is a gentleman. That's a small country. It has the longest border with us, from Aqaba to Lake Tabir. And we have a beginning of a uh, rapport with the, with the Palestinians. And ladies and gentlemen, politics is not a question of love. If you look for love between people, forget it. Love sometimes succeeds when a, between a man and a woman. I hope it succeeds more than people think. But between nations, it's a question of mutual interest, mutual understanding, and mutual strength. That's why we keep our armed forces at top efficiency, at top level. Again, something cynical. That would, the first arms we got from a communist country, Czechoslovakia, blessed by Stalin. I went to Prague in May, 9th of May, 1948. And Prague was full of photographs of Stalin as big as this house in red flag. I said, to hell with this, get me, give him my aeroplane and I'm flying back home. But next, we got equipment from France. The Six Day War was fought entirely and 100% on French aeroplanes. Not a single American plane. Not even a P-51. Pardon? The Mystère, that's right. The Mystère de Ouagan, the, the Mirage. And the Six-Day War is a one-time shot. It can never happen again in such a crazy state. And uh, now we're 100% American, and we're quite happy. We fly A4s, F4s, F-16s, F-15s, you name it, and it's top fighter planes in the world. And a very good close relation between Pentagon and us, between the armed forces and us. Now, I wrote a, a book way back, published in 74, where I was full of Eretz Yisrael HaShlema. And I believed in it. I still wish it, it could have happened. 
timing. We skip the time. And now we'll have to settle down on partitioning. What is yours and what is mine of the Western Bay. He's already in Gaza. He controls the big city. Jenin, Tulkarin, Kalkidia, Nablus, Ramallah, Bethlehem and Jericho. And I'm very happy to, to know that we're st restarting, restarting talking to them this morning. It's not easy. With the Egyptians it was much easier. But I think the whole part is concerned. Egypt, Jordan, Palestinians and us must be out of our mind to blow the situation up to such a situation that we'll have a war again. Because everybody only tends to lose. Especially the next war has, if it comes, and I hope it doesn't, has more lethal weapons that can hit you from distances. It's a completely def different ball game than even the October War. So to be f afraid of a war is bad. To use the old saying, la sus et la crowd, to be, to, 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 to gallop into, into battle is stupid. And this is, I think, what our government now is battling with. And one thing I want to tell you, and I'll let you ask questions, I don't want to be too, too long winded, is that I believe that democracy is the antithesis of unity. Because democracy, the essence of it is party. And each party has its own opinion. And it's free to voice and free to act. America is lucky she has only two. Ross Perot pops up from time to time, puts $30 million on the, on the barrel and loses it and goes home. But then it's his business. But basically you have two parties. In France, it's a bit mixed up. Look what happens now. England has four parties, two major ones, two small ones. We have eight or nine. And the, the problem is not how to unite everybody, but how to have a larger common denominator with the system prevailing. And for instance, when Begin presented to the Knesset the peace treaty and asked them to vote for it, 86 out of 120 voted for. When he was, the Likud was in power and Labour was in opposition. When Yitzhak Rabin brought the peace with Jordan to the Knesset, 100 out of 120 when Likud was in, in, in opposition and voted for. Which comes to show you when you have a sensible solution, a viable solution, I hope the sensible members of Knesset vote for it in a major basis. Not all of them. You'll never get 120 members of the Knesset voting for it. And this is the situation we're in now. Where I hope that the government will be wise enough and speedy enough to come to a solution before the balloon goes up. I think we can do it. I think all of them other possibilities are bad. We have the United States with us. Unfortunately, we don't have the whole world with us because of certain things we did which questionable what should have been done. And I am confident, it's not a question of being optimistic or pessimistic, I'm confident that wisdom will prevail and within the foreseeable future, which can be, I don't want to quote months or years, will find peace with the Palestinians, an arrangement, an agreement, and hopefully with the Syrians too, which is not easy, because the strength of Israel in the 21st century will be the strength of knowledge and perfection. We are now very proud of our high-tech um, industry. We have a per capita income of $17,000. The whole Arab world together doesn't have that. And it was done on, on brains, on efficiency, on ability, 
and on, 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 on willpower. Our purpose now is to build our economy, if only for one reason, to build a basis to receive more Jews into the country, because what we need is a lot of people. We're 4.7 now. We are now the second largest community in the world, Jewish community, after the United States. The United States today is, what, five and a half, close to six million? I don't want to ask my standard question, what will be the Jewish community in the United States and in France in 30 years hence? What is the intermarriage? I think I know the solution, and I think I know the, 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 the answer, I think I know the solution too, but, but I don't want to start arguing today. And a day will come, not very far off, that if we have peace, and if we zip up the, the, the economy, which we can, especially in knowledgeable, knowledgeable fields, we can be easily six million here, six and a half million, and the United States will probably drop to four and a half and five. I don't wish it to them, but I wish some of them, if they don't want to drop to that, to drop around the corner here. Gentlemen, this is very briefly, very briefly, I've got 101 more things to tell you, but I suggest you ask me questions. Thank you. Yes, my lady. Where, where are you from? Ah! What you suggest is the solution. It has. It has. Now. No, 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 nobody stands trial when it offends you. No, don't exaggerate. Style is still looks after Jews. Sit down, please. Sit down, please. The situation is not easy, but this is in an interim period. We're in an interim, interim period. There are 150,000 Mitnachalim in the Western Bank. And about four and a half million Jews in 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 this, in this part. So there's a proportion to it, and we have to think very very hard. What will happen? What will happen? I don't want to remind you what I just mentioned about Mr. Begin. And uh, I think we can find a solution of living together in the Western Bank, but certainly not at. <laughs> the gentleman puts me up. There are a few people who don't understand English. Ah, it's a few words in the Hebrew. That's easy. Uh, I don't know. I was introduced in English. I can, I can. We're now on the verge of coming to a settlement. And the terror is less than what it was. Cover yourself with one bad example. We have less troubles in the Gaza area. We have to start thinking differently to what we thought before. And believe me, Sal can do things. Sal can walk in with tanks and we can bomb, we can bomb the, uh, the Nablus and we can bomb Janine and we can move with tanks. It won't help. I hope that we'll find a solution. And the Lomo Ray is not always the peace. I flew over it up, they didn't look at you. I know it's not a good answer for your good question, but the situation is not good. We have to find a solution, a bigger one, they just for a long way. Yes, sir. Look, I'm not worried. I'm annoyed. And I think that he's... He, I think this is not behaving the way it should behave. But there are certain things in negotiations 
that you have to know what you would give up in the negotiations and what you leave for the last minute. I want to tell you one thing. With all the, uh, the terrible descriptions that my good lady here said, we are one of the finest armies in the world. The Air Force is one of the best ones that I know, and I know all Air Force. Anyone from England here? Yeah. Well, it, 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 it can compete with RAF easily. I know both of them very well. And we have all sorts of clever things. We can easily take our army and bash back into Gaza. If you don't change the charter now, I'll walk in with 500 tanks into Gaza and God help. And I'll do the same thing to Janin, to Tulkarim, to Kalkilia, to Nablus, to Bethlehem, to Rawal. He knows it. You know, he's not in an easy situation. I'm not, the charter is wrong. One day we have to put our foot down. That's, that's uh, no question about it. But you must realize one thing. When he wants to fly from Gaza to Ramallah, he has to ask our permission. And he flies over our territory. If he misbehaves himself, if he wants to go to, to, to anywhere, he has to ask our permission. He's not a very happy leader. He wants what we want. He wants the whole of Israel. So did I. So did I. But we didn't have enough strength in 1948. And I don't blame anyone. Thank God we had a few volunteers to the Air Force who flew with us. Because we hardly ever. We were three Israeli pilots. Two were killed. I had more luck than Seychelles. And always remember that Israel is a strong country. And it gets stronger from day by day because we get 40 to 50,000 new immigrants every year. By the way, I want to mention one thing. It's nothing to do with your question. The 700,000 Russians that came here is one of the best contributions to Israel, culture, industry. They, they pick up Hebrew after four or five years. They speak like Israelis. They're in the army. When you visit plants in the industry, you see 15 to 20 percent of them there. And it's the finest aliyah that we had since the German aliyah in the 30s. With all due respect to other aliyahs too. I think that American aliyah, in a big way, can add on culturally more to the country. But this is up to you. Love us from the distance, I would like to hug you from a closer range. Yes, sir. Sit down, sit down. That's it. Without, without going into an argument with you, without going into an argument with you, I beg to differ. I beg to differ. Because in the Bible you can find anything you want. Moshe, in his last words, in Hazino, he calls us, Am Naval Velochacham. What shall I do with this? Am I right? It says so. It says so. I'm Naval Velochacham. Reb Moshe the Great calls me Naval Velochacham. 
טוב, תודה רבה, בשביל המעשים שלה. ובשביל המעשים שלו, הוא לא נכנס לארץ ישראל, יש תשמעים בקנד, לגרוב בפינגר ולמצוא כל מיני דברים. And I love the Bible. I'm glad I have another one. Usually in my desk here, in my office I have a Bible. Next to my bed I have a Bible. In my car I have a Bible. If I want to refer to something, I tell my driver, pick it up, I want to have a look. And I'm not a scholar of the Bible. Take it. Come along with him and leave. Arabanim Europa. You read my name? You know, there's a story that a, a Zionist leader came to London, went to one of the Whitechapel areas, and he asked the people gathered there, what would you like to speak, Yiddish or English? He, he says, they, said, they all called back, said, speak English, Yiddish we all know. So, no question about it. That we have to find our way how to keep Judaism in the 21st century. We have to find it, it's not easy. Look, I'm, I'll take myself as an example. The president of the state of Israel. I was born a secular. I am a secular Jew. Although in this um, duty, in this house, I eat only kosher, not only this house. Now, I eat only kosher and I don't travel on Shabbat. I, I didn't impose it. I decided my... Yeah. By the way, not to travel on Shabbat is not a very... Uh, it's... it's uh, anyone who wants me comes to me. If he doesn't want to, you should have... I don't vouch for that, that if when I leave the post, I'll behave with those things. And then Israel was created in the last 120 years, basically by secular people who kept to the Tanakh, who kept tradition, but basically secular people. I'm not boasting, and I, I don't know if it's a question of being proud of or not. We, our task and aim in life from, the, from our, this much was to create a Jewish state. I was brought up on it. I was taught that, I was drilled for that, I joined the RAF for that, I came back from the RAF for that, I fought most of the wars of Israel, I missed the Lebanese war, I'm not sorry, and, 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 and all my generation had an aim and a task in life. Isn't that a great mitzvah to live in Israel? Isn't that one of the mitzvot? You live in Israel? Yes? Yes, okay. Baruch yeah. Hashem, you are you, you fulfilling one of the great mitzvot. So, a few things, horrible things happened to us. Six million. Why did it happen? I sometimes have sleepless nights thinking, why did, why did it happen? Why is it that six million Jews died in such a terrible way? There are all sorts of experiences. I have mine, you have yours. I tell you one thing, my dear friend. That the survival of Judaism is only here. It might be. Only here. In the next, in the 21st century. And we have to confront with and face modern technology. We have to face the peace. The people will fly to Mars not only a teeny weeny little thing crawling up there. And that the 21st century is going to be even different to the 20th, that was completely different to the 19th. We live under a big scare of nuclear weapons. We're now 50 years without big wars. Only for one reason, because people are afraid of wars. Once in the history of mankind, they're afraid because of this terrible contraption that human beings invented themselves. Some few good Jews contribute to that. So we have a few things that we have to think about what has happened and what is going to happen in the 21st century. And what is an Israeli Jew? We, we have a problem of how to teach our youngsters what an Israeli Jew 
and in the diaspora they have a problem with how to stay Jews. I don't know whether we can help each other. Yes. Between America and us? Who is the expert? They or us? So if they came out with a list of violations, why are they going to talk today? Okay. Look, I, I understand the question. I talked about mutual interest. And you know what? I'd rather find a mutual interest than mutual trust. Trust comes on the way. I don't trust all Jews. Believe me, I know some Jews that don't trust. They would, could be they don't trust me. I'm talking as, a, as an ordinary civilian in this country. Do I trust everybody? Just because it's been a year, you can trust me. You have to find the common interests of both parties, the common dangers, the mutual, the mutual wills and wishes for the future. And I told him when I spoke, very quickly, a few minutes ago, that all parties concerned, Egypt, Jordan, Palestinians and us, are going to be idiots to bring a situation to such a way that the war will break out. So, I don't trust all of them. I have my army, I have my air force, I trust them. I wish I could reach a day that I could trust them. I trusted Sadat. And he trusted me. Because we spoke in a language that produced trust. It's like love, which is what I talked about love. Look for mutual interests. Look for mutual ambitions. Look for economic interests. For, 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 whatever you, for whatever you want. Once you get that, perhaps in the long run, you'll get trust too. But to say now, I don't trust you, therefore I don't want to talk to you, you one one step so the war. So I'll talk to this, I don't want to use his foul language in the presence of the signature there. But I'll talk to this. But I'll talk to it. Yeah. Mostly. Not all of them. I, I told you that we have a problem. That how to you into the young generation, what, an Israeli, what is an Israeli Jew? I told you when I started. And I told you that we have a problem, you have a problem how to remain Jews, we have a problem how to be an Israeli Jew. And I think that we're moving. Look, I went to see my eldest grandson was on the eve of joining the army at 18. They had a great party. They finished school, there were about 135 of them. Girls and boys. 
And you know, they gave a performance that I could take to Broadway. And they were taught the Tanakh, and not very much more. But you should see the dedication. And I'm not saying that everything is fighting and everything is war. Out of these the high percentage who went super commander units, who volunteered for flying schools, who volunteered for navy commanders, who went to, to, to not, to all of them will join the army, be just in the paratroopers, just in the infantry, or just in the artillery, or just in the tank corps. But most of them are pushing to go to hard units, and very difficult units. I think that we have a young generation that we have problems with Judaism with but we don't have problems with Zionism. Now, do you want me to start arguing and discussing what is Zionism? First of all, Zionism is living here, loving it, fighting for it, working for it, building a country that is not built yet. And I know that is criticism, and bridges fall, and people get drowned, and all sorts, all sorts of things. Nobody looks at the fact that we're 17,000 per capita income. Nobody looks seriously. I had to open CNN a few days ago to see Bill Gates talking. Poor man, he only earns about 20 million a day. And what was he praising? He was praising the brains of Israel. So I don't say we don't have a problem. But the main problem first was to establish a state, to fight against the Arabs, to teach the youngsters that, that this is dead, dead education. I know that we have too, too many Israelis that left the country. So they let them stay out there. Some of them are coming back. Where does the way you teach Judaism and the way I was taught, look, I was by mitzvah last, what are we, last month, 60 years ago, not bad. Parashat Ba'alotcha. My haftarah was Charya Gimal, and I had there a pasuk, which is for me. Lo v'chayil v'lo v'chorach kim v'ruchi amar adonah. Okay? And I was glad that I did it. And the story about the Tanakh is not when I, not the war of independence. When I joined the REF, 55 years ago next month, my mother, bought me a small Tanakh, a beauty, which I still keep, this one with me all through the Second World War, four years, starting over in the RAF. And then when I came back, it was with me all the time, now it's in my home in Kisari. So, for instance, I don't like that some of believing Jews don't join the army. Why don't they join the army? Why don't they come and fight with my grandson? Why is that? What's the, what, what, what's the excuse for that? Is this written in the Bible somewhere? What would Joshua would have said about that? What would Bar Kochba said about that? What would Yudah Maccabee said about it? 